Hello again, we're still in J.C. Ryle's expository thoughts on the Gospels, his two volumes on Luke, here in one volume. At the end of every chapter, based on each segment of the Gospel of Luke and the other Gospels and his other volumes, he has notes, and these are notes on specific points during this five-verse segment, Luke 21, verses 20 to 24. The first point he wants to make is about verse 20, when ye shall see, etc. He says from this verse, down to the end of the verse, of the 24th verse, our Lord's prophecy is entirely confined to the last days of Jerusalem and the duties of his disciples during that eventful period. Here at all events, there is no reference to his second advent and the last siege of Jerusalem after its future restoration. The siege by Titus and destruction by the Romans are exclusively the subject under our eyes. And about the phrase, Jerusalem compassed with armies, then no. He says the following historical facts are well worth notice. They show in a remarkable manner how the words of our Lord in this verse were accomplished. It appears that three years before the siege of Jerusalem by Titus, the Roman army under Cestius Gallus made a sudden attack upon Jerusalem, but most unaccountably and without any apparent reason withdrew again although the city might have been taken with ease. The consequence of this attack was that a large number of the inhabitants of Jerusalem took alarm and withdrew from the city as soon as the Roman army had retired. To use the words of Josephus, they swam away as from a ship about to sink. Among those who escaped were the Christians, some of them retiring to Pella and some to Mount Libanus. The result of this was that when in the last great war under Vespasian and Titus, broke out shortly afterwards, the Christians almost entirely escaped its desolation. It seems a high probability that the Christians remembered the very words of our Lord, which we are now considering, and that the remembrance of them was the preservation of their lives. They saw in the advance of the Roman army under Cestius Gallus the predicted sign of desolation drawing nigh. They at once acted on the advice of their master and so escape the miseries of the final siege. And then about the phrase in verse 21, flee to the mountains. Another commentator, Major, remarks, quote, these were the mountains to the northeast of Jerusalem, towards the source of the Jordan, which was in the territories of Agrippa, that is Herod Agrippa. He continued faithful, that is loyal to the Romans, and hence the Christians avoided the destruction which overspread Judea. The invasion was Judea, and that was not under Herod's jurisdiction. And then about the phrase, days of vengeance, that the things written may be fulfilled, that's verse 22. The vengeance spoken of here appears to me to be the righteous retribution of God on the Jewish nation for all their sins against him from the time when they first entered Canaan. I cannot confine it to vengeance for the sins of the nation during the last few hundred years of their existence after the Babylonian captivity. The words of our Lord in Matthew 23 verses 35 and 36 appear, appear to confirm this view, and that's the verses about the sins of the fathers being visited upon that generation. The things written appear to me to include all the heavy judgments foretold in the Old Testament as coming on the Jews, and to begin with the 26th, 26th chapter of Leviticus. And the phrase in verse 23, woe to them with child, and the give suck, etc., the miseries of women in the siege of Jerusalem, are specially foretold in Deuteronomy 28, verse 56. And the phrase in the land in that same verse, here as in many other places in the Gospels, the land seems especially to mean the land of Palestine. Now, verse 24, fall by the edge of the sword. Joseph, Josephus records that there perished in the siege of Jerusalem by sword and by famine no less than 1,100,000 1 Jews. That's 1,100,000 Jews perished in the siege. The, the rest were led away captive, according to this verse. Josephus records that in the course of the war, 97,000 Jews were made captives, and most of them were sent as slaves into Egypt or dispersed over the provinces of the Roman Empire to be cast to the wild beasts in the amphitheaters. 
and then to the phrase that is dispute among even followers of Pastor Russell. Russell believed that it was to be literally understood and his successors to this day do not believe it's to be literally understood. The phrase Jerusalem trodden down of the Gentiles. This expression means that the city of Jerusalem shall be possessed by Gentile nations and cruelly oppressed as a captive city until the Jews shall be restored to their own land, which is what Russell and early Rutherford expected, to the point that Rutherford even wrote a book in 1925 released called Comfort for the Jews. How literally, Riles says, how literally and exactly these words have been fulfilled, all readers of history know. In spite of all the efforts of the Crusaders, Jerusalem has almost always been a city trampled underfoot and cruelly oppressed by Romans, Greeks, Saracens, and Turks from the time of Titus down to the present day. This is 1858 again, so... Ryle did not see an end to that, but it happened shortly after he died. Until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now he gets down to the various options here with this expression. This expression is variously interpreted. First interpretation, as with Bishop Pierce, they put a vague general meaning on it and say it signifies till the Gentiles have done all which God intended them to do. The second interpretation, some think with Hammond that it refers entirely to something already past, and that it was accomplished after the days of the Emperor Hadrian, when a church composed of Gentiles Christians and converted Jews was set up at Jerusalem and flourished for a short time. The third option, some think with Whitby and Newcomb that it refers entirely to things to come and that the time of the Gentiles will be fulfilled when they are fully, all fully converted to Christianity. That is a worldwide conversion of Gentiles. That's, that was once fashionable, that idea. I should say a worldwide conversion of Gentiles to Christianity Believe it or not, there was a time when a lot of Christians believed that. It's a, it's a version of prophetic interpretation called post-millennialism. And then there's the fourth option, the true view, according to Ryle, I believe to be this. The times of the Gentiles I regard as the period between the first and second advents of Christ, during which the Gentile nations have a day of visitation and enjoy the privileges of the gospel. These times will come to an end at last, as the old Jewish dispensation did, because of the hardness and unbelief of the Gentile churches. They too, because they continue not in God's goodness, will be cut off. And when their time of visitation comes to an end, and they have been found as faithless and hardened as the Jews, then at last will the Jews be converted and Jerusalem restored to its rightful possessors. Our own times, be it remembered, are the times of the Gentiles. They are times which seem rapidly drawing to an end. When they do end, the conversion of the Jews and the restoration of Jerusalem will take place. So, Ryle doesn't say it, but he might as well, that if this hardening goes on in the Gentile churches, that it will result in a general apostasy, the apostasy predicted in 2 Thessalonians by Paul. And that will be the final state of things when Christ returns. Reminds me of that verse in Luke 18 where Christ asked the question, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? Well, Ryle died in 1900, and 17 years later, Jerusalem was captured by the British Empire under Allenby. I'm putting a link on your screen to uh, interpretation of Revelation 14, where you have the, the holy city being mentioned but not by name and then we're told that the the wine press of God's wrath is being trodden outside the city. What did Robert Govett, uh, by the way a contemporary of J.C. Ryle but originally Anglican like Ryle but later on associated with the brethren, the Plymouth brethren, what did Govett make of this Revelation 14 passage in contrast to the the familiar, well, for some of us familiar and ridiculous interpretation which the Watchtower put upon it in 1917 in the book Finished Mystery. So we put a link to that on your screen. And the next part, portion of the, the book of uh, the exposition of Luke here is where 
Rao goes from these five verses that are about the siege of Jerusalem and its consequent events and the scattering of the Jews and the trampling by the Gentiles to the signs of the last days, verses 25 through 33.